This is Marco Reus. This is Shinji Kagawa. This is Nuri Shahin. Hello, this is Jaden Sancho. And you're listening to the Yellow Wall podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 463 of the Yellow Wall Pod. I'm your host, Stefan Butzko, and today we will talk about Borussia Dortmund winning 3 0 in Darmstadt to close out the Hinrunde. Jane Sancho and Marco Reus linking up again. Ian Marzen making his debut as a left back. Gregor Kobel being our primary playmaker. Fitness concerns about Niklas Süle. G. Reyna being determined to leave BVB in this winter. And Saturday's game against SFC Köln. For all that and more. Join me, Matthias Zuck. Hello, Matthias. How are you doing? I am doing okay. Stefan, how are you? Not too bad, not too bad. Also here, Lars Poimann. Hello, Lars. Good to have you back. How are you? Hello, Stefan. Thanks for having me again. Um, I'm looking out of my window and it's a regular winter wonderland. So uh, me being inclined to, I guess, bad weather, some people would say I'm quite content with this. Yeah, I was just going to ask, are you someone that likes the snow or not, because I feel like the older I get, the less I like it. I'm becoming more and more of a curmudgeon. So I'm I'm glad you at least get some joy out of it, because I uh, just had to clean the snow and ice off uh, our car, and it was not fun. So well, the, the point <laughs> is that we barely ever get snow here in the Rhineland, so every once in a couple of years or so, we have a couple of snow days, so they are quite enjoyable, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, enjoy yourself, Matthias. Uh, you being in Colorado, I know uh, you have much more of this weird white stuff falling from the sky. Uh, in Philadelphia, it was also the first snow, I think, in two years, thanks to climate change. Uh, Matthias, uh, how do you like snow? <laughs> oh, I, I enjoy the Colorado snow. When I lived outside of Philadelphia, I hated it because the power always went out. Um, whereas here in 12 years, the power never goes out when it snows and it's much nicer snow. It's the nice powder stuff. Well, that is good for you. Do you ski then? Is this a thing? I used to, um, but I decided I'd rather walk. So we're, we're not skiing anymore. <laughs> All right. I'm going to quit stalling now. Uh, <laughs> we do have to talk about the three nothing win, uh, in Darmstadt, which, uh, had very enjoyable moments, but uh, also some uh, moments that do raise some eyebrows here and there. But uh, I think, uh, why not start with the most positive one? Uh, at least for me personal, uh, Jane Sancho and Marco Reus linking up again uh, was a bit of a cleanser for my soul personally. I just thought uh, in, in that particular moment everything was right with the world. Obviously, you have to wait and see if uh, it was an offside or not. Um, but when uh, Dortmund made it to nothing finally and uh yeah you see old friends uh link up again like this uh, it did warm my heart uh matthias were you also emotional when uh <laughs> when that occurred i don't tend to get that emotional anymore with the cynical world of professional football however that was really nice to see it was joyous you could see You could really see the joy on both of their faces. And obviously the cameras focused a lot on Marco Reus in that second. And you could just see that was true joy. Beyond just the joy of scoring a goal, it was just joy. And uh, that was that was indeed very nice to see on a cold, windy night in Stoke, uh, Darmstadt. <laughs> um, so that was that was great. And, and then, um, yeah, I mean, we'll talk about the rest of the match. But uh, no, that was nice to see. Yeah, Lars, maybe uh, since you haven't been on in a couple of weeks, uh, how do you uh, see the uh, Sancho signing, uh, him returning, obviously, uh, in the uh, videos that Borussia Dortmund posted, uh, you could see him being also very focused on uh, Marco Reus in the beginning, uh, asking where he's sitting in the locker room, etc., etc., since I guess this is the... Uh, closest uh, friend he had while being at Dortmund or that is still here at, at least um but uh, overall what do you what do you make of uh, this uh, impromptu signing 
well, I don't know how much of an impromptu signing it actually was because I think um, we've all heard rumors and rumblings about Sancho's returning uh, quite a few months in advance. I think there was already a bit of a topic in the summer. Um, obviously, that didn't come off because I suppose they were more happy with their squad planning than they are right now after the first half of the season. Uh, correctly so, because quite obviously they've um, been playing disappointingly in two out of the three competitions, which isn't good enough. I tend to think, regardless of whether or not he stays in the summer, and obviously it seems reasonably unlikely just because of the financial um, terms that are going to be asked uh, of Dortmund, both in terms of uh, a signing fee and wages and um, a transfer fee, not a signing fee. Um, Regardless of that, I think it's a very good idea to add a player you know very well, you know works in the league, knows and you know works at your club for what is uh, a fairly low financial outlay. I think in terms of the the risk reward kind of uh, thinking, I struggle to find whom else Dortmund could assign for these uh, five months, as it were, uh, who could have a higher impact. Um, on on their second half of the season for what they are paying him because uh, today it's been reported by Sportbild that they are covering a third of his wages for the rest of the season. Uh, Man United also covering a third and him foregoing uh, two and a half million euros for this for the rest of the season. There's a I suppose nominal uh, uh, loan fee that's being sent to United, but ultimately if that comes out to let's say an investment of five and a half or six million. I bet you can't tell me a single player they could have signed uh, on a long-term deal with those um, kind of terms who would have even close to the impact that Sancho can have. Now, obviously, the question is, is he going to have that impact? But I think uh, the the 30-odd minute cameo against Darmstadt already gave us a few hints in that regard because, quite frankly, most people were wondering how he's going to look after four months of suspension at Man United not being able to train even with the first team there. And I think he looked sprightly, uh, quite uh, lean, maybe a couple of kilos away from his best fighting weight, if you like. But I think that this was a very encouraging performance uh, in, in all aspects. And obviously the, the thing that comes to uh, the fore the most with Sancho is just the joy. I think you can tell whether it's him speaking to the media, speaking to club media, uh, or even, you know, when he's getting subbed on, when he's assisting the goal for Royce, there's just a huge smile on his face. And I think he's the kind of player that needs a certain type of atmosphere around him to succeed. And Dortmund is quite clearly the the place for that. And, and so I'm quite positive that it's going to work out very well. And ultimately, if it's a six-month or five-month um, cameo back at Dortmund and he gets them back into the Champions League, then everyone can part ways in the summer and, and uh, congratulate each other on a, a job well done. Yeah, when uh, the Bundesliga conducted the uh, Portsmouth interview, which we got to see on ESPN, uh, he was asked about his personal goals and uh, he said why he is not going to reveal uh, his true personal goals, which maybe are participating in the Euros or, I don't know, you know, <laughs> just getting out the mud. <laughs> um, he, he basically said that uh, for now it's just being happy again. And I feel like that really uh, shows a lot of insight. And yeah, um, he was very involved when he came on. Um, I think he had one of the highest averages in, in, in touches uh, in the stint. He did play. Um, and uh, overall, uh, you can see that he is not well versed uh, with Eden Tessic's system yet because he made just a lot of positive runs and uh, didn't get the memo yet that we don't do that here. Um, but uh, yeah, all kidding aside, um, I think uh, you can immediately see his his influence on the on the game um, and uh, the way the opposition respects him. Now, obviously, um, it was also, um, I, I guess, a bit advantageous for him that Darmstadt uh, at that time were already fairly fatigued um but that being said um it is very exciting to have him back because it seems like he will make the difference here and there for the black and yellows and that's exactly 
why they brought him back. So uh, as far as first impressions go, um, that was pretty good. And I feel like that's the perfect segue uh, to the left-back signing from FC Chelsea. Uh, also on loan, Ian Martin, Matthias Zouk, uh impressed me quite a bit as well. Uh, what were your first impressions? Oh, for sure. Uh, he looked calm on the ball, able to move under pressure in tight spaces, way more comfortably than most other left backs we've had, uh, you know, aside from Guerrero, but I'm talking about this season. But with that, you get uh, pace. You can see that. He also hustled back, which, as everyone knows, has always been one of my biggest issues with Guerrero in the past is brilliant and all the attacking aspects when it comes to defensive, that was really uh, his major weak point, which isn't good when you are a left back defender. Um, and Matson showed also, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, right off the bat that he is doing it well. I mean, yeah, kind of like you mentioned with Sancho, there were a few moments of, let's call it automatisms not being there yet, but these, you know, I mean, he was there for what, 12 hours, maybe since he was announced, um, and, uh, got to, got to play. And I thought did really, really well. Um, when Julian Riasson comes back, I'll be honest, I just want, you know, based on this performance, you've got Riasson on the right and Matson on the left, even though I have to say Thomas Meunier also had a pretty decent game. I can't really think of many bonehead moments there. I'm like, oh no, I just wasn't really concerned about fullbacks, which was really nice for 90 minutes. Yeah, it, it, it was nice, uh, at, at least in, in that regard. Uh, I think Lassie tweeted that uh, it's very important to have a fullback that's comfortable in tight spaces if you don't have any build-up play otherwise. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it was interesting to see how attacking minded he, he is, so what kind of runs he made. It was uh, sad to uh, see that uh, Donny Malen in particular, who uh, teamed up with him on the left side, didn't quite find him quickly enough uh, because uh, he stepped on the ball too often instead of uh, playing it quickly, but maybe there are some chemistry to be built. Who knows? Um, but definitely uh, interesting to see someone making such positive run and runs. And uh, obviously in the 20th minute, um, Dortmund did create their first chance with Ian Martin breaking through on the left side and then having this cross to Julian Brandt, where uh, <laughs> maybe if he headed the ball instead of trying to... Uh, <laughs> uh, shoot with his uh, right foot he might have had a higher chance of converting but I, I honestly don't know um, but uh, yeah to me very positive um, Lars how did you see his first performance and then maybe in a, in a wider range we can also pivot to Dortmund's uh, builder play otherwise I think you can't but be hugely impressed by what he did as Matthias Arun to basically a day before being announced. Obviously, he uh, trained with the team a bit before then because there were some uh, formalities to be concluded with Chelsea. I think there were a couple of signatures missing, but the transfer or the loan transfer was never really in in question or in doubt. Um, given that he's barely had any uh, time to get to know his teammates, I'm, I'm sure he hasn't spoken to all of them uh, individually just yet because... Uh, it's just the nature of having a 30 odd man squad you don't spend much time with everyone um given given all those circumstances I, I, you have to be impressed with what he did and i think it's quite apparent why they were interested in him a couple of times before already i think he's basically the replacement of guerrero with some differences in his profile. I think he's definitely more athletic, uh, which, I mean, it's hard to be less athletic than Guerrero while still, <laughs> while still being a very good player uh, in this day and age. Um, he's probably a bit less technical because, quite frankly, Guerrero is a ridiculous technician on the ball. But, you know, I think the the added athleticism is quite important because, uh, as Matthias also alluded to, Guerrero never really cared much about defending. I don't know that Martin necessarily has great defensive instincts himself, but just by virtue of being a great athlete, that's oftentimes enough as a fullback to get by defensively. I think someone like Alfonso Davies at Bayern 
kind of showed that, especially early on. He wasn't because he was a converted winger, basically. Uh, he didn't have great defensive instincts, but when you can run everyone down in, in sprinting duels and have a pretty compact body build, even though Martin is quite short, um, he's still compact and, and quite muscular, so he's not going to be pushed off the ball too easily. Uh, obviously, you don't want him to you know, get involved in aerial duels or whatever, but that's basically the same for every uh, short fullback, which Dortmund are quite used to, obviously, because of Guerrero and, and to an extent also because of uh, Morey and, and Marius Wolf isn't great in the air either, so that's all not, not a big issue. And I think the uh, the biggest bonus, especially compared to Benze Baini, who's often involved in build-up, um, but it's just not one of his strong suits, uh, is um, the, the forward-mindedness of Martin. Uh, his first touch is always um, judged to go forward. Uh, he's always thinking about moving forward. You can tell that he's played extensively on the wing for uh, Burnley, for example, where he was quite instrumental in their promotion uh, to the Premier League, uh, playing oftentimes in a more advanced role. Um, and quite frankly, as you alluded to us uh, moving into discussion of their build-up issues, having someone who's always open and willing to receive a ball and progress the ball it's not something Dortmund have an abundance of, uh, given who's usually playing in central midfield. Um, there's always, or not always, but the, the most popular move in Dortmund's build-up is lateral, and I think Martin is a vertical player, and that's uh, something that will stand them in good stead going forward. And I'm especially looking forward to the occasions where Martin and Sancho will combine on the left wing, which I think we will see uh, soon enough. Yeah. I mean, after this winter break, I was really impressed with the uh, transformation of the team and how well they played uh, in terms of ball circulation and uh, what a flow of the game. I think in the first half, there was even like a three-minute stint of ball possession where they uh, yeah, were, were nearly unfazed by, by the opposition. And uh, that was really nice to see, especially con contrasted with... Uh, how the team looked in the past where they basically just hoofed it long but unfortunately the team I'm talking about right now is Darmstadt and uh, they are if you look at the table the worst team in the league uh, meanwhile Dortmund uh, ball progression ball circulation all these things uh, not so much a theme I think uh, the most prominent uh, point of discussion uh, on the internet that I saw is that um, when uh, basically when Dortmund had a goal kick that uh, Gregor Kobel just moved the ball up a few yards and then uh, repetitively, I would say, tried to find uh, Niklas Füllkrug. Uh, if I remember correctly, there was one successful uh, play coming out of this, which resulted in a in a snapshot by but uh, by Daniel Malen. But other than that, um, not a very efficient way to start. Now, obviously... Um, Matthias, <laughs> it was already interesting to see Emre Can uh, playing center back uh, with Hummels having uh, uh, the flu um, instead of Niklas Süle, which meant we had uh, Can, Öschan, and uh, if you will, uh, maybe uh, Zabitza uh, triangle in, in midfield. Uh, and of course, Julian Brandt also involved in, in the build-up play. Um, to me, the the lack of creativity right there is actually quite jarring. And uh, when we talk about Giorena later uh, and the fact that he is not included uh, more in, in, in this process um, is, is to me a bit of an indictment on, on the black and yellows. But overall, um, I think while it was nice to come away with a 3 nothing win, I think maybe even the highest of the season... Um, I thought it was very disappointing the way Dortmund did play. Um, obviously, you can't expect a massive transformation, but nevertheless, uh, they did have uh, a bit of an off-season, and uh, I was left uh, very disappointed uh, by the way Dortmund played on the ball. Um, what what did you make of uh, how Dortmund uh, moved the ball around or not moved the ball around? You know, it's a really weird match, because uh, you win 3-1, uh, XG looked good, uh, 3.1 for Dortmund. Darmstadt underperformed their XG of 1.0. Uh, the only difference is that 3.1 uh, 
came with eight shots on target versus the 1.0 came with two shots on target. Uh, Gregor Kobel only had to make two saves, but one of them was a world-class last-ditch need to make, but, you know, that's why you have Gregor Kobel. Uh, it, it's weird because, you know, Dortmund, during the course of the match, only had 50-odd more touches than Darmstadt, only played 50 more passes than Darmstadt, and... Um, 52% possession only, you know, and those are um, statistics that, you know, can tell one of two stories. It could tell the story that, you know, Darmstadt actually set up well. I thought Thorsten uh, Lieberknecht did a good job in just basically, you know, everyone could see it. They man-marked the entire back four of Dortmund, sat then largely on Zaliochan in that sixth position, and, say, and let Kulba just walk up the pitch and hoof it somewhere. Uh, and did a great job in limiting uh, any opportunity of a build-up play uh, for Dortmund, which was the moment you take someone out like Mats Hummels, you already lose a lot of that anyway. Um, but that, that, that was really weird. It was, it was interesting to watch. Darmstadt, I think, had a very good tactical plan that almost paid off, but that's kind of been their story in a few matches this season. I want to say against Bayern, they had a good tactical approach until they got a red card and it all kind of fell apart then really quickly. And against Dortmund, they had a good tactical plan. And then, you know, as you had mentioned before, they got tired and then you bring on someone like Jaden Sancho and Yusufa Mukoko, whose goal was absolutely brilliant. Um, and they they just don't have the quality to, to to then play with you. But until, yeah, I would say until that 55th minute, um, until you saw Royce and Sancho came, come on, it was tough. I mean, uh, the, the German word C which basically means tough, but in a, in a different way, it just kind of underlines it. It was, it was, it was okay. It wasn't great. I wouldn't say it wasn't good. It was average. And, um, you know, the, the bench, the depth of the bench, the quality of the bench really made the difference for Dortmund, but you'd like to have seen more of that sooner. Uh, I know you mentioned Zavitsa. I actually thought he didn't play badly. I thought he had a pretty good game overall, and the again, Royce coming on and Sancho coming on made a big difference uh, in the pace of the way Dortmund played and the way they held possession a little bit better. And just the drive towards goal uh, was significantly better from that moment on. And that that does leave me with a few question marks, because before that, most of the impetus I felt came over someone like Ian Matson, And that's that's a problem when someone who's been there for like five minutes is one of your key catalysts to get the ball forward in dangerous positions. Yeah, uh, I would wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> it's uh, it's not great. Obviously, uh, you, you talk about the individual class, and I mean, if we look at the first goal that Dortmund did score, uh, Jamie Bino Gittens on a counterattack does two to three defenders, however you want to call it, and uh, yeah, great pass by him to Julian Brandt and a nice run by by Malen to draw a defender away from from Brandt. So he had this one on one matchup and then uh, I think didn't hit it perfectly um, the way he wanted, but just still well enough for the ball then to to beat the goalkeeper and, and roll into the net. Um, but until then, uh, like I said, Dortmund did not really create much, did not really dominate the game like the way you would expect a team against Darmstadt to dominate uh, that game. Um, Lars, while we are all airing our grievances, I'm sure you two have a lot of those. <laughs> uh, what, watching this game, uh, I know it's a win, but uh, I feel like having a more of a long-term view, it did not feel uh, encouraging. No, it didn't. Um, I think there are obviously always some mitigating circumstances you can... Uh, put out there I think watching a lot of these games over the weekend in the Bundesliga you can tell that they had a three week winter break um, a lot of teams looking quite rusty uh, Leverkusen didn't really look like the Leverkusen we've come to know this season for example 
Um, Leipzig had, I think, 26 shots or so against Frankfurt, but only two or three really good ones and subsequently lost at home. Um, actually, I thought of the teams that I watched, Stuttgart were probably the best side and they were uh, beaten at the end rather soundly 3-1 uh, to one by Gladbach. So I think we have to take that into account. But obviously we know that this isn't a one-time thing for Dortmund. These problems have permeated throughout the season and uh, I don't really see a reason why things would suddenly get so much better. I mean, while well, they had a three-week winter break, uh, that's three weeks without a game, but it's not three weeks of intensive uh, training sessions. Um, ultimately, I think the only real sessions that, that count were probably held in uh, Malaga or uh, Mabea rather in the in the summer training camp. And uh, I think those were like six or seven uh, units of practice. So I think it, it's quite stupid to expect things to miraculously change because you signed Nuri Shine and Sven Bender as new assistant coaches. Um, obviously, they ought to have an impact eventually, but uh, that, that stuff takes time. So they haven't changed materially the players that are responsible for the build-up, which I think we can safely assume now is the, the biggest issue because once they're in the final third, they have so much quality that enough goals will come, even though they don't really... Uh, Trounce opponents this season, but you know that's that that was the case as well last year. And then in the second half of the season, they turned it up and, and scored a lot of goals. So that might still happen as well this season, but um, it's still uh, a problematic um, position what they have in front of the fence. Uh, I think they are kind of crying out for. Netscher to come back, which is an indictment in itself because Netscher wasn't particularly good in the first half of the season, but at least the type of player he is, they are def definitely missing. So I think it's going to still be a struggle sometimes. Um, and as you said, Stefan, Darmstadt were better on the ball in the first half of the season, uh, in the first half of this game rather. And the only difference until the halftime and, and maybe until Darmstadt's uh, legs gave away a bit was that one moment of individual brilliance by Bino Gittens. I think if Fulkrug made better decisions, um, they might have scored a second one because once he took too long to take a shot and then I think in the second half already he shot himself when he could have released. Uh, might have been Bino Gittens, might have been Malen uh, on the right who would have been clear on goal. Um, so it's not like necessarily the win was in huge danger, but that wasn't, I would say, down to Dortmund's brilliance or anything, or their great defending, even though, for example, Schlotterbeck had a very solid game in defense, but mostly because Darmstadt is probably the, we the weakest opponent Dortmund will face the entire second half of the season. So <laughs> I suppose it's good that Darmstadt is the one team they faced twice in 2024, uh, or, you know, before the summer break. Yeah, uh, that is uh, for sure. Um, I am uh, glad about that fact too, especially that the next time they see each other, it'll be in Dortmund, which I guess will be uh, uh, another advantage. Uh, I, I hope by then Dortmund have nothing to play for in a good way, meaning uh, that they will already have their Champions League qualification wrapped up. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, Girena because I do feel like... Um, that he could alleviate some of Dortmund's ailments in, in the build-up play. Um, but uh, for that to happen, the fittest ever Gio Reyna, at least according to Edin Terzic and uh, the uh, fitness values uh, that were shown in the uh, during the fitness tests. Um, yeah, he needs to play, obviously, uh, but right now he is uh, not really playing. <laughs> uh, he had a very late cameo and... Uh, yeah, uh, got a yellow card for kicking the ball away when he was when it was already out of play uh, in frustration, and I feel like that frustration uh, is also materializing its way to uh, pushing for a transfer away from Dortmund to uh, reignite his career. And who can blame him, considering that's the way uh, he is being utilized uh, in Dortmund right now, which is not really at all. And uh, so yeah, if the reports are true and Dortmund let him go for 15 million. I'd be rather miffed because uh, that is a lot of uh, money wasted in my view. Giorena, um 
is a much be better player and should at least in my book uh leave for a much higher transfer fee but in order to achieve that he needs to be a, a, a regular and, and play much better obviously uh, which he does not really have a chance to showcase. Um, I, of course, also don't know how w how and what he's showing in training. Maybe him playing from the beginning isn't warranted. Um, but Matthias, I feel like he could be maybe a solution, especially against opponents like Darmstadt, um, to to play him instead of maybe a Zabitzer, even though you said Zabitzer had an okay game, but I do think that Girena has... Uh, capabilities in his passing that uh, Zabitzer just doesn't have and uh, also him linking up with Brandt I, I think there can be a lot of positive football coming out of that um, so what what do you make out of this situation and the uh, reports swirling around currently well I mean you and I talked about Gio Reyna last week um, and you know my opinion and I do not have a very high opinion of Gio Reyna uh, not because of uh, talent or potential because you said a lot of cans and coulds and maybes and that is Gio Reyna right now in a nutshell for the last 12 plus months is maybes cans and could bees you know he had some injury issues in the past those seem to be gone if he's as fit as he's ever been good for him um, you know don't wish anyone to be injured but then there's a bigger issue behind it um, the yellow card I remember I was watching it with my eldest son, and I went, well, that's stupid, and I'm not surprised. I d it's just my personal opinion of Gio Reyna by, <laughs> by when his... When I was just imagining you sitting there oh, yeah. with your arms crossed saying exactly, like, yeah, like yes, I've been saying. Yes. <laughs> A petulant, spoiled brat. And that is how he comes across far too often. And you can't have that. Um, and yeah... Does he have more technical ability in one foot than Masa Zabitza has in both? Yeah, I don't even deny that. Does he have the same work rate as Masa Zabitza? No, he does not. I'd, there's no proof in that. Um, and there was also a moment there where, you know, Jaden Sancho was just so wide open, so wide open, and Gio Reyna didn't play him the ball. He had the ball in the perfect position and didn't play it. And there's no way he couldn't have seen him. There is no way. And he just held the ball too long, made the wrong decision, and poof, that opportunity was gone. Whereas Jaden Sancho was in a perfect position to go in on goal, and he didn't do it. And that is your job as a playmaker. And those are kind of the types of moments where if you want to start, if you want to warrant playing more, you have to take those opportunities to do it. And yeah, there are obviously issues in training. There are obviously issues off the pitch, attitude issues. Otherwise, he would be playing. He's an asset when everything is right. When things aren't right, he's a liability, uh, in my opinion, because he won't press properly. He won't position properly. He won't run back properly. He won't work properly. And that in a midfield position where we know Dortmund can have and has had issues in retaining position possession and it breaking down there in transition going forward and then leaving the back line wrong footed and flat footed. I just see that as a risk and a risk that obviously it in Tessich and the coaches at Dortmund um, for a longer time have also seen as a risk and therefore don't trust the player. And I think if the if the coaches don't trust him, then yeah, he should go somewhere else. And I hope he goes somewhere else, reinvigorates his career, actually gets it going properly, let's be honest, because he's still really young. Uh, it's not quite the situation as Jaden Sancho uh, in that regards. Uh, would I consider a loan deal and see if he can do something for half a season somewhere and then reevaluate? I think that would be probably more prudent right now rather than letting him go for 15 or 20 million. I agree with you that that's given his potential under value. Um, but I can understand him wanting to go and his agents pushing for it, his team. Uh, that has been a problem, in, in my opinion, given his 
his issues with Greg Berhalter. So yeah, he could be a great asset. Is he an answer for Dortmund's woes? No. I'm sorry, USA fanboys out there about Gio Reyna who constantly tweet at me that he's the solution to Dortmund's problems, and he's not. Uh, it goes beyond that. Uh, can he help solve those? Yes. But then that has to come from him. And don't get a yellow card for kicking a ball away because you're frustrated that you couldn't retain possession on the sideline. And keep your head up a little bit more for looking for the right pass. And then things will be fine. Yeah, that's, uh, what do you think Dortmund should do in the whole Girena uh, situation? Do you think that uh, selling him now for about 50 million would be wise? I don't. Um, I don't know what they need the money for right now. I mean, balancing the books or whatever, because they're definitely not signing another uh, attacking-minded player after getting Sancho. Um, so I don't know what selling Reyna in the winter would do for them. Uh, obviously, it's quite apparent that both his father, Claudio, and his new agent, George Mendes, are pushing for a deal right now. I mean, whenever a high-profile player switches uh, agencies during a season or in right ahead of a transfer window, I think the, the writing is basically on the wall. And there's so many reports, uh, ESPN, a lot of German uh, outlets, even local media from interested clubs about um, you know possible destinations for him that there's quite obviously something there. And there might be a situation where Dortmund need to make a decision. If I were um, asked to make that decision, I would probably go for a loan deal until the summer. Maybe he can find his footing somewhere. Um, but obviously no particularly good club takes uh, a player for five months um, unless he's, you know, a great uh, market opportunity. So, for example, Sancho for Dortmund because they know what he can do. And if, if he can come close to uh, his ceiling, then he's someone that improves Dortmund tremendously. And I don't necessarily see Reyna as that kind of player just yet because he's 21 and has lost quite a bit of momentum in his young career due to injuries and now not really playing much for Dortmund. So I don't know that necessarily there's going to be the perfect loan opportunity. And seeing as his contract is running out in 2025, uh, a transfer in the summer would then be the obvious one if nothing happens in the winter, just because I don't really see how going from the situation as it currently presents itself, we would come to uh, a situation where Reyna and his team uh, would be comfortable signing a contract extension at Dortmund, and obviously they don't want to lose um, somewhat highly rated players uh, on, on free transfer. So um, the, the one thing I'm struggling with is that seems reasonable to assume that Dortmund are not going to retain Mark Reus in the summer. Um, that's just the vibe we are getting in, in from German media and all, and all that. And then, obviously, the one of the problems that Reiner has right now, uh, you know, that both Brandt and Reus are in front of him in the pecking order and he has to be shipped out to the wing and, and, and all that stuff, that kind of goes away. And if you've sold Reiner in the winter for, I agree, a below his genuine market devaluation um, and then Reus leaves in the summer and you have to sign a new central attacking midfielder. Um, why did you let go of someone who's clearly talented, who I think is a better footballer than Christian Pulisic, for example, who went to Chelsea for 64 million? Um, at least in theory, I think he's better. So that's that's the, the thing I'm struggling with to, to reconcile uh, the, the prospect of Royce leaving or maybe ending his career uh, and then not having Reyna, uh, you know, to, to step in. I think that would be the opposite of, of good squad planning. But quite frankly, Dortmund have quite might have made quite a few uh, decisions that turn out to be head scratches and, and some of them even from the start. So I wouldn't necessarily be surprised if they caved in to the demands of the player side, which again, quite clearly point to um, him leaving in the next two weeks, I think, because the transfer window in most big European leagues closes on uh, February the 1st. 
Yeah, I'll be honest. I don't think that selling Giorena right now, uh, you know, pretty much as low as it gets, uh, helps Dortmund in any case. Uh, I do remember Sebastian Kehl um, saying or indicating to the media um, that uh, sort of Giorena is being viewed as a successor to Marco Reus eventually. Um, but obviously, uh, none of us know the exact timeline for that. But uh, that being said, um, yeah, I I do hope that uh, there's a way for him to uh, make himself more valuable for Dortmund to at least sell him in the summer. Um, because uh, I assume the way uh, injury luck goes in Dortmund, that there, there might be a chance for him to play more here and there. Um, but obviously uh, not what I want right now for him to play uh, this way. I feel like he could also uh, play himself into the squad more on, on merit. But as Matthias said, that needs to come from him. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's also interesting um, to, to read the reports that uh, uh, Dortmund are maybe not going to extend Marco Rose's contract and then he... I think I think someone uh, I said, read something of him going to Gladbach then uh, or something like that, and uh, Dortmund fans uh, getting very frustrated and upset that uh, of the idea of Marco Reus not ending his career uh, with Borussia Dortmund, uh, not because uh, Reus uh, <laughs> is going elsewhere, but rather Dortmund not extending him. But um, yeah, I had this discussion yesterday with my wife. Um, and I do feel like maybe from a financial standpoint, it does make sense for Dortmund not to extend him because he does earn a lot of money and his output isn't quite as where it used to be. But that all being said, he is uh, n not drawing absolutely ridiculous wages. And uh, I still think he, he is good enough. So I personally, I think I would extend with Marco Reus for another year. Um as as I would do with Mats Hummels, obviously. Um, so there's that. <sighs> but in the meantime, um, let's talk about another defender. Niklas Dule has uh, been also in the headlines uh, for not being uh, fit enough, uh, according to the coaching staff. Um, Matthias, Niklas Dule, uh, obviously... As a very big guy, is uh, someone who has to often battle with conditioning and uh, whatnot. Uh, if you, I don't know if you watch NBA, but uh, you know, tall players often have issues with conditioning uh, much more than than uh, smaller players, just because of the way uh, it it works. Um, Niklas Zule, uh, of course, has a um, reputation for that. Um, do you think? Um, Tesic not playing him until the very end of the game uh, did send the right message to him and Dortmund fans can expect that he will be in better shape soon enough. And do you think this is a big issue for the black and yellows or is this just uh, something where media makes more out of it than it really is? Man, I've got a lot of yeses and a couple of noes in there. Um <laughs> Yes, it's the right message um, because, yeah, they, they needed some uh, defensive cover in that moment. He's obviously your best choice in that moment. But starting Emre Can over him, who is undoubtedly fit. I mean, we can all have our criticism, criticism of Emre Can. Fitness, pace, and work rate are not his his weaknesses by far. Um, and Zule, yeah, he's a big frame dude. And uh, that comes with those issues. Uh, you you could kind of see it. He's a he's a bigger kid, um, and so kid. I mean, he's not even that young anymore. I guess he is for <laughs> I guess he is for me. Um, but whether or not the message goes through to him, it seems it is. Will that make a difference? I don't know. I'm not Niklas Zula. That's that's a question only he can answer. Do I think the media is making more out of this than it is? Yeah. But, you know, that's, I, I hate to say it, that's the media's job <laughs> to a degree, you know, to find these little things and ask questions and then pose headlines that are, you know, maybe not not quite as big as they'd, they'd like to make it out to be. Um, it, it's a fitness thing. 
get your fitness in order and, you know, Niklas Zulu will then be playing because he's a very good central defender. Um, but if there's a fitness concern, especially if you're worried about counterattacks and things like that, you know, then Emre Can is your better choice athletically uh, as well as uh, Schlotterbeck athletically. And that is an area that Zula then has to work on, who is surprisingly quick. I mean, he's played plenty of matches at right back and done surprisingly well. Uh, but y- you need to work on it a little bit more when you're a little bit bigger. Yeah, uh, that's for sure. I mean, I had to chuckle when uh, Tessic said why uh, Emre Can was picked over in Krasile that uh, one of the aspects of why Emre Can got the nod was uh, pace because I do think that uh, Niklas Süle is actually faster than Emre Can, but... Uh, you know, that's just... Uh... <laughs> it's deceptive. That's the thing. With with Chan, you can see him running really fast. With Zula, every time he plays right back, I'm always surprised at the pace, probably because you're looking at a different frame. Yeah. Well, um, Lars, what can we expect uh, now from Dortmund uh, this weekend in Cologne? Uh, we have played uh, the bottom team now the second to last team in Erste FC Köln who are going to a world of struggles uh, have somehow managed to get themselves a transfer ban. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that whole story um, or not, um, but uh, they have also changed coaches. Uh, a lot of turmoil at Erste FC Köln. Um, also, not really playing any good football. Uh, if I remember correctly, Dortmund beat them one nothing early in the season. Obviously, since it was the first game and uh, were really riding their luck to get uh, even three points out of that game. Um, so, at least on paper, Dortmund should go to the Rhein-Energie-Stadion or whatever the heck it's called and come away with three points. But uh, yeah, how are those prospects? Maybe talk about the the transfer bin, ban uh, just for you know a second, because it's, it's quite a dumb story in a way, uh, because uh, the transfer ban has been uh, instituted because they signed a 16-year-old kid from Slovenia who... Uh, I think was with them during the winter break, but hasn't featured obviously for the first team just yet. Um, the the punishment came because for you know the the regulatory boards and all that stuff. Um, it was proven beyond reasonable doubt that they made the kid break his contract uh, at his uh, home club. Um, so. Whenever you can get a transfer ban because you're signing a teenager to play in your academy, uh, go for it, obviously. Uh, quite a dumb story. And, and also, I think if we wanted to talk about it at length, I, I, I guess you could make the case that bigger clubs, uh, let's say Manchester City, would not have gotten a transfer ban over this stuff because quite quite possibly they just would have paid the uh, the kids club you know five million euros to uh, in terms of hush money and and obviously Cologne don't have that kind of money so um, the transfer ban really coming in clutch for uh, I guess everyone in in the bottom half of the the Bundesliga and maybe even Dortmund this weekend because uh, not only is there a transfer ban and have they let go of Steffen Baumgart who was kind of synonymous with uh, Cologne for the last two and a half years. But now they are also in a deep injury crisis because uh, Davy Zelke, uh, their best goal scorer, I think he's got five goals, which doesn't sound like much, but it's the same that Niklas Füllkrug has, for example. Um, <laughs> also doesn't sound like much. Yeah, and I don't know. If five goals after half a season for a club that's struggling against relegation that comes up to 10 goals at the end of the season, that's not a terrible uh, output. Uh, not great, but not terrible. Um, but he's injured for a few weeks. Uh, Luca Waldschmidt is injured. Mark Uth is injured. So the three best, um, if if we can say that, or you know the 
potentially best or the the three most important or however you want to call it uh, attacking players Lars, you you're meaning to tell me that Stefan Tigges is not their main source for, for goal scoring no he's not but obviously that might change against Dortmund because uh I seem to recall that he did quite well whenever he's played against uh, his former club uh, at least he did last season I don't know if he even played in, in both meetings he I think he missed the first game of this season because of injury but um I mean Cologne is the the local club where I live because uh yeah in the Rhineland uh there's Cologne there's Gladbach there's Leverkusen but Cologne is really the the local and and the biggest club obviously of those three historically speaking and you could the the last few weeks it's it's felt like the sky is falling for a lot of people because of the transfer ban because of uh, Baumgart leaving uh his replacement Timo Schulz for a lot of people, not the most inspired choice. Uh, he's new to the Bundesliga after uh, failing to get promoted with St. Pauli. He was then sacked because of lack of development uh, at the second division club, which isn't a great sign, I suppose. And then he went to FC Basel. Uh, and he's part of the reason why Basel are struggling against relegation in, in Switzerland after being uh, regular champions a few years ago. So um, there's not a lot of confidence in him necessarily. And... I think it's quite helpful for Dortmund that it's the second home game in a row for Cologne because uh, there was quite a bit of hype surrounding uh, Schultz's debut, you know, clean slate after the winter break and all that. And they played at home to Heidenheim, went ahead by a fairly decent Selke goal. And then there was basically nothing. They conceded the equalizer from uh, Heidenheim and uh, the, the last 25, 30 minutes there was basically not much happening and considering that Cologne were at home against a side that is on paper at least comparable in terms of you know individual quality and all that that was a bit disappointing for a lot of Köln supporters um, as you said they are second to last I think they concluded the first half of the season with uh, both 11 goals and 11 points uh, which as one can quite easily tell is a terrible terrible um result for half a season and because of all the things we've mentioned there's not much hope that things are going to get much better over the next uh five months um right now and i think ahead of the season when we did our predictions i think we mentioned cologne as a possible surprise relegation candidate and i think right now the the only thing that we have to strike from that is the surprising part because Cologne look definitely like one of the two or three worst sides in the Bundesliga, and um, I yeah, you have them in tenth. Uh, myself and Matthias both have Cologne in twelve. Yeah, but I said like from tenth to seventeenth or whatever, I could see anything. So that's yeah. true. Uh, so long to make uh, a long answer. But I also picked Dortmund first with my internal wisdom. <laughs> yeah, that was okay. okay. That was just that was just dumb. <laughs> um, just to to. <laughs> actually answer your final question uh what can we expect from okay. Dortmund I mean if they don't uh come away with three points here then they are in deep trouble that is correct <laughs> that is very much correct so Matthias uh, obviously uh the game in Darmstadt was successful result wise but footballing wise uh not so great do you think there are any things that Dortmund can ch change to the lineup um, to make improvements or do you think the lineup that started against Darmstadt uh, warrants another start and uh, you would hope that they build more chemistry, automatisms, all this nonsense uh, uh, as they progress in that game? Well, I think uh, one is if Mats Hummels is fit, he'll probably start. Uh, you would hope so because that always helps Dortmund, especially in build-up. Would that um, mean Emre Can as number six then instead of probably? I would I would I would assume uh, you'd move John uh, into that position, and then if you're gonna play two ahead of a six, so two eights, yeah, you'd probably do a, a Zabitza Brandt kind of thing, and on the wings, you know, I don't want to have a lot of options now. I think it's still too early for Sancho um, uh, at this point. Uh, Royce, I, you know, I personally believe you should start Marco Royce in that match. 
And then always yeah, actually I mean, score against Cologne. He does, he does. And then I think Jamie Bino Gittens. Uh, I would start him ahead of Donny Malen right now, uh, just because I think this could be the right kind of match for him. And then at striker, um, you know, I think we did, we didn't uh, talk a lot about Yusufa Mukoko, who, uh, funnily enough, he got subbed in and my son was like oh he's totally gonna score and i'm like okay and then he did and uh it wasn't quite jj okocha against uh you know i think it was Karlsruhe. was that bayern Karlsruhe, that's right it was oliver khan but it was Karlsruhe. um but there there were a couple of moments like i had some flashbacks there to my youth and i'm like whoa and that was a really nice goal. And Yusuf Amukoko did more in the few minutes he was on there than, in my opinion, Fulkruk did for most of the match. Uh, Fulkruk's been a little flat. Um, I, he'll probably start because Tezic will start him. I honestly would love to see what Mukoko could do with more time um, because I think that showed what he's capable of. And maybe you attack... Uh, the cone with a little bit more more pace than than uh with with Fulkuk up top but odds are you're probably the the main change you'll probably see is uh Mats Hummels coming in and then uh, Zalia Chan going out would be my expectation because Tezic isn't really one to make any major changes or revolutionary thought processes not that anything I said was major or revolutionary <laughs> yeah, I saw a lot of uh, demands after that Mo- uh, Mokoku goal for him to start from the beginning. Um, I think uh, the the two largest pro arguments of Mokoku is a that uh, I think Niklas Füllkrug um, has a ceiling and Dortmund are not going to profit off him in any sort of way. Uh, Yusuf Mokoku um, has at least the potential uh, to become a breakout striker and uh, really... Uh, <laughs> Phil Dortmund's balance sheet. Uh, I know it's a very cynical way of looking at it, but uh, this is how Dortmund's business model functions, and uh, they need to develop young players to uh, remain relevant <laughs> financially, and so um, that is what needs to happen. So I do think that there should be more incentive um, to play Mokoko. Unfortunately, um, more often than not, uh, he has also struggled with injury. If he had a, a prolonged uh, starting uh, string, let's say. But um, the other incentive is, if it's Mokoko up front, at least I hope in, in my <laughs> in my book it means uh, Domina have have fewer incentives to to just move the ball forward and need to find different solutions but obviously uh, you don't know in uh, in reality whether they they uh, actually stop playing uh, all these long balls and be if they do uh, do they actually play well or just lose the ball in other position of the field which then is more detrimental so i don't know but um, yeah i'm actually kind of with you matthias i too would play mokoko just because i do feel like um, it's okay to mix things up. But that being said, um, Eden Tessic's approach uh, is to have a strong hold-up striker up front and uh, then uh, play on from there. And uh, I mean, with Sebastian Allaire, it obviously works much better than uh, with Niklas Füllkrug, but at least Füllkrug is uh, is doing a, a decent job overall, I would say. And he has had some uh, good moments and nice touches, flick-ons, and etc., so it's not like he's completely useless in that regard. But uh, yeah, uh, if you have a youthful, exuberant uh, attacking line, that's uh, on paper just more exciting, um, but uh, can, of course, go wrong. Uh, Lars, your thoughts on uh, on that starting lineup and, and the, the tweaks we just discussed? Uh, would you play Mukuku right now instead of Fukuk? Or uh, do you think this is... Uh, we are all uh, maybe... Not thinking straight after Mokoko got to pick apart a Darmstadt team that uh, was super fatigued. I mean, I don't know that Darmstadt were dead on on their legs or whatever. I think we are kind of exaggerating a little bit when we talk about the. I feel like they were. Yeah, but not. But, At least that that was my but, impression. But not in every single individual moment. I mean, it's it's not like uh, someone uh, turned the dials on 
is it EAFC 24 all the way to zero for, for Darmstadt and Bay? They couldn't <laughs> run anymore. So I don't know. Um, I, no, that's exactly what happened. I think I'm a bit surprised at how critical a lot of people are of Fulkrug. Um, I think when you sign perhaps the uh, leading goal scorer of last season, even if it's only been 16 goals and I think five of those from the penalty spot, um, and also, you know, the, the starting striker from the German national team, maybe the expectations are a bit higher, but to be honest, um, I think he does enough things well uh, that I would keep him in the starting lineup, um, especially considering how much time we spent talking about the build-up issues. I can understand your thought process, uh, Stefan, in saying if you don't have a, a hold-up striker, you have to play out from the back and all that, but we just don't know that they are good enough at that, so... I'd, I'd rather stick... <laughs> I feel like we do know that they're not, but... I'd, I'd rather stick with what I think Fulkrug does best in a Dortmund shirt so far, which is play with the back to the goal, stick out your butt, um, hold up play, maybe, uh, you know, those those uh, clutch moments, as we say, not clutch in as in C-L-U-T-C-H, <laughs> but uh, K-L-A-T-S-C-H which uh, is like clap. So when, when a striker gets the ball and he immediately releases with one touch, that's clutch in German football lingo. And that that's something he does quite well. He has those flicks with, uh, you know, the, the back heel and all that. So I think he, the, the five goals we already talked about, that's not a great, uh, you know, turnout for the starting striker of a team like Borussia Dortmund. But he also... How many assists does he also, have? That's what I'm going to get at. He's, he also got five assists in the Bundesliga, which is a very strong number for a striker whose ultimate job is scoring himself. So um, the the thing yeah, the thing I, with Mokoko is that... Do, do you have the number of pre-assists too? No, because I feel like no, there were a couple as I well. don't care about that stuff. Um, <laughs> I do. Yeah, then you can look it up while I keep talking about why... I don't I'm, think I can. This why quickly. I wouldn't start <laughs> Mokoko... Um, I think whenever he's gotten a chance to start, obviously it hasn't been the case much uh, of late, but it, it kind of felt to me like he was forcing things a bit because he knew that it was a fairly rare chance. Um, I think he does obviously um, do well off the bench quite a lot, but that might be because of you know energy levels, as you alluded to. And quite frankly, we know that Mukoko has an impact off the bench, Um I don't know that we can say the same thing about Fulkrug just from his, you know, striking profile. He doesn't strike me, as it were, as the top joker to use another German football lingo terminology. I think Fulkrug off the bench, that doesn't ring a bell for me. So I would keep uh, starting Fulkrug and just hope that, you know, maybe uh, he needs a, the kind of game which they might have. Uh, might the might have against Cologne where a lot of things work in their way and he scores a double and things get easier because quite the 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 biggest problem right now to me isn't you know a lack of general quality or whatever I think just the decision making uh for Fulkrug has been off and it has been off for weeks uh, quite a lot of times he's going for you know a hopeful shot from distance when he could have released a a, a colleague. Uh, you know, with a through ball or whatever. And also he's been kind of unlucky because a lot of times when, for example, Bino Gittens or Marlon break through, they have eyes for the goal and he's, you know, sitting there waiting for a cutback pass, which would give him a great opportunity. So once again, to make things a bit more concise, start Fulkrug, bring Mukoko off the bench and obviously Alea not in the picture because of uh, AFCON. Yes. Uh, un unfortunate, but uh, yeah, I do want to uh, see how Alea is doing at AFCON and uh, whether um, he can get sort of in a form where he then will start for Dortmund eventually because I personally really miss him uh, in a, a in a good form, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, if uh, we could get Alea back in a, in a better physical shape at, at some point this season, I think that would also uh, turn things around quite a bit for Dortmund just as it did last season but uh, not a guarantee of course um, uh, but uh, yeah thank you uh, for uh, that discussion because uh, I'm very much intrigued about uh, the tinkering right now and uh, yeah we'll, we'll also see 
uh, if Dortmund do improve in their build-up uh, over the next couple of weeks because uh, between games currently they at least have time um, to, to train so sometimes that can make a difference in terms of football league development I obviously don't know if uh, Nuri Jain and uh, Sven Bender in that regard do have an impact if we can expect a different course different development uh, we'll see season is still very long uh, still a lot of games to go and uh, yeah one way or another uh, Cologne have to be beaten uh, Matthias any final thoughts before we knock it on the head yeah, just the same one I had against uh, Darmstadt don't screw it up and <laughs> you'll be fine all right thank you so much uh, then uh, everyone out there I hope you have a fun weekend uh, thank you for listening until next time goodbye